friends, we want to welcome you to Stillwater. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so thankful that you decided uh, to join us for worship today. Uh, we have, uh, we, in this message series, been talking about what it means to put our trust in God. And, and this weekend, we're looking at what it means uh, to do so in a way that is sacrificial. And that's not always one of our, ex- our areas of expertise as Americans. We don't love to make sacrifices. We love to be more extravagant to help ourselves out. But God calls us to live a life of sacrifice. Uh, this, this weekend on Friday, we had a great banquet here for Tijuana Christian Mission. Um, it's a wonderful mission that Stillwater has gotten to partner with uh, for many years now. And uh, we are blessed this morning because Seth is here. We want to invite Seth to come forward from Tijuana Christian Mission. Won't you welcome Seth? So Seth is here from Tijuana Christian Mission, all the way from Tijuana, just to spend some time here with us, and uh, that is a big blessing. I got to uh, learn more firsthand about Seth's place uh, this past year as I got to visit Tijuana with a number of you, and let me tell you, God is doing some amazing things there. You all just celebrated 50 years, right? Yes. That's a big deal, isn't it? 50 years in ministry? Yes. And... So, so Seth is going to tell us a little bit about the role that, that sacrifice had, has played in making Tijuana Christian Mission possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's, it's amazing watching the, the, the video you shared, very touching about your veterans. You know that the connection of Tijuana Christian Mission with Ohio has always been very big. Uh, the, in fact, the pastor that went to, um, to get my parents to start this, uh, an or, uh, not an orphanage, but a church, and then the, the orphanage, uh, came about is a, was a pastor here in, o- here in Ohio, and the first pastor that uh, that sponsored the orphanage was a military man. That uh, part of his sacrifice after being in war was preaching the gospel, and and the orphanage came about. Um, uh, when you talk about sacrifices, uh, my parents, uh, I don't want to say they sacrificed their lives because. Um, they're still living, but but really, to sacrifice is to give of one for another. And this church here has been such a blessing for the orphanage for so many years. Uh, so many uh, loving people have sponsored us, sponsored our children for for I want to say thirty years. Really, it, this was our sixteenth sixteenth annual banquet that we've had here, and it's always. A big help to what we have to do there in Tijuana. Usually, what the banquet covers is a whole month's operational for what we have to do the whole year for the children in Tijuana. And um, as I was as I was um, thinking about the word of sacrifice, um, the word of God says, "Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are please, pleasing to God." In Hebrews thirteen sixteen. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you've been such, such faithful partners with us in this ministry. And this 50th uh, year, we got to uh, do a big party, but more than anything, just have all the alumni come and just kids that have grown. I know kids that have been sponsored by people in Stillwaters that are now engineers, that are now architects, that are now lawyers. And that's what your sacrifice when you give, when you share what you have with us. And that's not just financial. It's going there. It's living with the kids, playing with them, and making them feel that the ultimate sacrifice in that cross was already made. And that's what moves people to share what you have. And I want to give, I want to present this plaque that we made for you um, in, in case you would have you would have showed up, <laughs> but um, I know you're busy doing so many things. But these are two hands of one of our some of our kids, and that was uh, cast. And it says to Stillwater United Methodist Church for your years of loving commitment and support to the children of Tijuana Christian Mission. Que Dios te bendiga. God bless you. Thank you so much. Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Seth. You know, God has been using this church for a long time to make an impact in the world, and that continues this day. And I want to thank so many of you for your sacrifice that's made that possible. I know Friday night we raised uh, roughly $8,700 for Tijuana Christian Mission, which is very exciting. And uh, yeah, that's worth clapping about. And there may be some of you here this morning who say, I missed the banquet, but I was hoping to be able to give uh, later this morning when our offering plates come around. If you want, you could write an additional check for Tijuana Christian Mission and make it out straight to them or uh, indicate that on your envelope and we'll make sure that that gets passed along to them. Uh, because it's certainly a ministry that we believe very strongly in and we are excited to get to partner with them uh, to see how Jesus is changing lives, not just here in Dayton, uh, but, but around the world. Sacrifice is, is something that when, when we're willing um, to let God use us, to, to give of ourselves so freely and generously, God does great things. Like Seth said, there are, there are children who are now adults whose lives have been changed thanks to the sacrifice of so many of you and so many others, uh, namely Seth and his family, uh, that they have given so much of their lives to be able to impact lives there in Tijuana, and that is just exciting stuff. You know, it's, it's a challenge sometimes to talk about sacrifice because we say, oh, well, nobody wants to hear about that, right? But, but the truth is, it was one of Jesus' key themes. I mean, Jesus himself is the ultimate example of sacrifice. How silly would it be for us to think that we can live lives that don't involve much sacrifice and then say that we're following Jesus because he is the ultimate example of sacrifice. So this morning, we're going to talk about sacrifice, especially in terms of finances. And maybe you're a guest here today and you're saying, dang it, I hate these churches that always talk about money. Well, you've kind of picked the wrong weekend, unfortunately, but lucky for you, we don't do this real often, right? So be sure you come back and give us another shot because we're in this little bit of a season every year where we make a focus on this because we strongly believe that giving, it's not just about finance, it's about heart change, it's about life change. And, and our giving tends to follow the change that God is making in our lives. So we've got, as we begin this morning, we've got a video uh, where uh, some folks are interviewed who are talking about this issue of financial sacrifice. Let's check this out. <laughs> give to God by enjoying what he has given me, okay? I mean, do you really think he expects something back? Now, I know there's a lot of people at church that would not understand this line of reasoning. That's why, just to make things simple and not to cause any controversy, I like to carry what I call the little empty envelope, all right? You see, when the plate gets passed, I bloop, put it in there like that. The deacon's counting the money. They only know me as the crazy empty envelope guy, but the people sitting around me, clueless. <laughs> I win, they win, God wins. No one gets hurt because no one knows. God knows. Huh? Let me ask you a question, huh? How's your mutual fund? Hey, for that matter, how's all your funds? Ha has the fund left your funds, huh? Has your do re taken a W-A-L-K, huh? <laughs> what if I told you that I knew about an investment you could make that the return would be mind-boggling? And, 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 and it's promised, it's guaranteed. I know what you're saying, there's no guarantees. This one's guaranteed, okay? Malachi 3.10, that's what it says in the Old Testament. It says, test me, give to God, and he will give you back. It goes like this, I give this, he gives this. I give this, he gives this. I give this, <laughs> up right up there. He keeps giving, I can't outgive God. How crazy is that? <laughs> Do I love him? Sure, whatever. I'm just saying, if you give, he gives back. <laughs> I tithe, but just not like in the form of a 10% check per se. Let me tell you what I mean. When I go to church on a Sunday morning, they're selling donuts, I buy some, boom, that's a tithe. When my whole Sunday school class wants donuts and I, out of the goodness of my heart, buy a whole bunch for the Sunday school class, boom, that's another tithe. But it's not about me spending money. It's about the smile on people's faces. That, my friends, is tithe enough for me. Case in point, the church was having date nights where we could take our spouse out for an evening and they were charging $25 for childcare. Boom, shakalaka, tithe. I'll tell you what the biggest tithe was. When I spent over $100 on our meal and my wife was grinning ear to ear, that, my friend's a tithe. I, I would like to give. I would, okay? But 
Everything right now is just crazy. I mean, just crazy, you know? I mean, not normal crazy, really crazy, you know? And if after I paid my bills and took care of the things that I need and want, then I would I would consider giving something, but not now is crazy. We're, we're, we're gonna give later, we've already talked about it. I mean, down the road we'll be crazy givers, but right now it's just crazy. Yeah, I have money, that's a fact. But you know what, it's a hard thing between me and the Lord and the pastor because he needs to know what I'm giving now that we have this little building campaign going on, if you know what I'm saying. And pastor, I'd give a little bit more. I'd give a little something, something if you'd have that music minister sing a couple more hymns now and then, huh? Hey, what's this, watch this. Is that a Benjamin? I think it is. Benji likes hymns, come on. You want it? Ah, come on, pastor, do what I say, huh? Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Oh, in my life, Lord, be glorified in me. I put money in the plate. Wait, wait, wait. Look what I have here. I hope it doesn't interfere. But that everyone can hear how I give with cheer. That everyone could be like me. There's a few different perspectives out there, right? We're going to look, that, that pageant giver, in fact, is an example of someone that, that Jesus encountered. Uh, he encountered a situation very similar to that, in fact. We're going to look at a story like that in the book of Mark, chapter 12. You can turn there in your Bibles, or we'll have that on the screens. It says this, Jesus went over to the collection box in the temple and sat and watched as crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two pennies. He called his disciples to him and said, I assure you, this poor widow has given more than all the others have given, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has. My friends, true love is a love that sacrifices. If you say that you love somebody, you make sacrifices for them. It's just part of the equation. It's part of what love is all about. And in this story, Jesus is talking about sacrifice. And it's a very interesting scenario um, because the temple uh, was the center place of worship in, in, his, in Jewish society in Jesus' day. The temple had been recently rebuilt. It was a very, very nice kind of fancy place. And it was the place where Jews would come to worship. When they would come in, uh, there were these 12 large brass containers shaped kind of like trumpets. And, and when they would come in uh, through the doors, their way of giving offering was that these 12 containers would be there. And they would come and they, they would put their gifts into the, these containers. Now, the temple was a loud place. It was a chaotic place. There were tons of people and they were bringing in animal sacrifices. So it was not this like quiet house of worship. It was a busy, bustling kind of place. And when people would come in to do their giving, it was also kind of a noisy event. Because in those days, they didn't give in the same way as we do, right? Like, like my family and I, we like to give online because that's how we do everything else. And so it's just a natural fit for us. Some of you give that way. Others, uh, we, we write checks, right? Well, they didn't have online giving in those days, right? Uh, they didn't have checks in those days. In fact, they didn't even have paper currency, the only money that they had was, was, were coins. And so when people would come in to do their giving, that was also kind of a loud type of thing as well because they would literally uh, put their coins into these brass receptacles. And, and so that was a bit noisy too. This day, Jesus comes in with his disciples and he does something that seems kind of awkward. I mean, if you can picture it, uh, we don't really do these offering plates too much. We have baskets. But if you can picture this, because it's the closest thing I could find in one of those trumpets, right? So not too close, but we'll go with it. So they've got their, their offering plate there when, when they walk in. And, and Jesus takes and he positions himself and his disciples near the door where they can see what's going on here. Okay? Now, does this seem kind of weird to you? It seems weird to me. But, you know, I mean, Jesus is sitting there, and he's watching people as they come in, and he's basically kind of evaluating their giving, which if we did offering that way, you'd probably like say, hey, 
can't we have that guy find a new seat? You know, it's awkward like having this like giving assessor who's sitting there. But the funny thing is, there were people there that day that actually, this is what they were shooting for, okay? They, they, were, they were that pageant giver type person, and they were wa- waiting for folks to kind of make a deal out of their giving, to see how much they were giving. In fact, historians tell us that there were some folks who, before they would give, they, they would actually go and they would get their gift in the smallest form of, of change they could, so it would be a big gift. You know, we're not just coming in with just a few coins. You can see that I went to the bank before coming to church today. So, so when this person would walk in and they'd see Jesus sitting right there, you can bet that a big smile came across their face, right? Saying, there's Jesus, you know, that teachy, religious kind of guy, and I bet he is going to be so proud of me, the super generous giver today. The Bible says in in that passage that that there were wealthy people who were coming in, and it said that they were placing their gifts in in those containers. The the verb there literally means to cast, like they were like chucking it in, right, for extra noise effect. So you can almost kind of picture, right, they come in and they're they're doing their giving, and, and it's a noisy kind of thing, right? Coins in brass receptacles, and you know, Jesus, nice to see you. I brought my gift today. If you don't mind, this is going to make a little noise. Sorry, but but oh my, you know, my generosity is so incredible. It it it's kind of even making a mess on the floor. Jesus, sorry about that. I guess if I wasn't quite so, gen- is there any laws? against bringing such a generous offering that makes a mess on the floor? If so, I am really, I'm embarrassed. I mean, boy, I should really dial back, I know. But when you give like I give, we need better receptacles around here, right? And it was loud, and it was kind of obnoxious. And Jesus sits there, and he doesn't really say anything. He's not really impressed by by the gift. And we say, "Well, well, why not? The reason is, as Jesus, remember, he knows everything. And Jesus knows that for this person, that as generous as this appears to be, for this person, that was just a bit of the surplus in their life. Tons more for the, where that came from. He knew that for those folks, they weren't really hurting to give that gift. It wasn't really sacrificial. Even though it could be seen as generous, even though it was substantial, it didn't cost them something. Because a sacrifice, in order to be a sacrifice, it's got a cost, right? I mean, a sacrifice that costs you nothing is not truly a sacrifice. Or a sacrifice where you give a tiny, tiny amount of something that you have a huge amount of surplus isn't really a sacrifice. That's not what Jesus is looking for. And so Jesus continues to sit there and he watches after the the wealthy people come in and they make their big gifts. And then this, this widow walks in and she walks in quietly. She doesn't have any bag with her. There's nothing grandiose about it, right? She just walks in and quietly, two coins. Did you hear that? Probably not. All the noise that day, all the, the, the busyness, all the hustle and bustle, all the big gifts, nobody would notice that little tiny gift. Except one. Jesus. He sees it, and he even stops and calls his disciples' attention to this gift, right? And he says, I assure you, this poor woman has given more than all the others have given. And they said, What? Are you not good at math, Jesus? Did you see the giant bag and the overflowing and then two coins? You've got to be kidding. What she gave, it was uh, two lepta. These were the type of coins. We've got a picture of them here. There were two very small copper coins. This, uh, the, the cash equivalent, this was 1 64th of a day's wage. Okay? So here, if you were working a minimum wage job in Ohio, eight hours a day, the financial equivalent would be one dollar and one cent in today's terms like a snack at a vending machine kind of gift. That's what she gave this day. Compared to the wealthy people who gave big gifts, this doesn't seem very significant. You can almost bet that there were some people that are saying, geez, I hope she doesn't stop by the donut table on the way out or else we're like losing money on that one today, right? I mean, she's not giving hardly anything. But Jesus doesn't look at it like that at all. Instead, he draws attention to, to her gift. Because Jesus, and, and he states that it's the greatest gift of all. 
because she's given out of her poverty. She had nothing. This is all that she had. And yet she chose to give it. For widows in those days, economics were really tough. There were not good jobs that they could get. Begging and prostitution were generally the only ways that widows could make money. Chances are good she was handed those coins when she was begging outside of the temple. Okay? If anybody had reason to not give that day, it's her. If anybody had reason to say, you know, I should just hold on to this and save this so I can eat later today, that would have been her. This is a painful gift, a truly sacrificial gift, and Jesus notices it. And the reason that he notices it is because giving is not about the amount, it's about the heart. Jesus is really clear on this. It's not about the amount, it's about the heart. And she gives with a generous heart. Can you imagine making a gift like that? I mean, that's, it's an uncommon gift. It's really not even the way that God calls us to gift. God, God calls us to give a 10% of our income to tithe. Well, she threw in 100%. That's not even requested in Scripture. And honestly, for me, it's uncomfortable because if I were her pastor and she's like, I have a dollar and one cent today, how much do you recommend I give? I would probably say, you know, you got to eat later today. The one cent, probably not too shabby, Right. I mean, the whole thing? That seems, if nothing else, like bad future planning. But yet Jesus, Jesus sees the heart that she gives with. And because he understands that giving is not about the amount, it's about the heart. And then Jesus says the key line in this whole thing, they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, as poor as she is, has given everything that she has. And it reminds us of the truth that God calls us to make equal sacrifices, not equal gifts. Some of you are here today and you know what it's like to be in this person's position. You know what it's like to, to not have a job, to not know where the next uh, meal perhaps is coming from. And you know what it's like to be in that situation. There's others of us that we haven't lived in, in that, with that, that life. We don't know what that, that pressure and that stress and that pain is like regardless Regardless, God calls us all to be sacrificial givers, to be people who give generously uh, because God doesn't call for equal gifts. He calls for equal sacrifice. And that's a call to every single one of us, regardless of our age, our income level, anything else. His sacrifice is what God honors because sacrifice is what Jesus modeled for us. This it's not really our expertise as Americans, is it? We don't look for ways that we can spend less on ourselves. We tend to look for ways that we can spend more on ourselves because we have this kind of funny phenomenon where we spend money that we don't have on things that we don't need to impress people who don't care, right? <laughs> we, we call it keeping up with the Joneses. And I don't know where, what it's like for you in your neighborhood of your, your, your circle of friends, but, but a lot of folks have this thing going on where, where we want to keep up with so-and-so. Let's say in your neighborhood, um, winter's coming, right? Let's say that in your neighborhood, it's snowblowers. And, you know, you've got your snowblower from last year, and it's a pretty good snowblower, but it's definitely not the newer model. And then your neighbor goes, and that jerk goes and buys the brand new, nice, not quite top of the line, but really good snowblower. And you're saying, hey, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, you go over and you talk to him, you're like, hey, nice snowblower, that's awesome, so happy you got that. But in your heart, you're thinking, now I got to go buy a new snowblower, right? Because I'm not going to be upstage by this guy's snowblower. So you go out and you buy the top of the line model. Why? Because you're not going to be outdone by him. And it's silly. Maybe snowblowers isn't your thing. But we all have that tendency sometimes to, to want to feel like we're keeping up. To want to feel like our stuff is as nice as somebody else's stuff because we feel in our hearts like we've kind of got this emptiness that somehow that will help. We call it retail therapy. That somehow that's going to fill this gap in my life. And we think that it's almost, it's, it's silly when you think about it. It's almost like we think that people are going to like us more or accept us more if we've got better stuff. But I don't think that it's true. We, pick on myself as an example here. In my family, we have, so we have three cars. I've told you before, I like older cars. 
our cars average uh, 17 years old, okay, and 100 some thousand miles. We don't mind because our way of doing cars is that we like to make car payments to ourselves because starting off, we never had money for interest, so we certainly weren't going to be doing it that way. So we made payments to ourselves. And today, if you, you know, you saw my fleet, you probably wouldn't be that impressed, right? It's, if you sold all our cars, it's worth 12 grand, okay? That's probably, I don't know if that's average or not average, it doesn't matter because they get us around. Now in a few years, uh, we're saving, so in a few years our old van, it's, it's getting kind of pathetic, we're going to have to replace it, we're going to buy something that'll be a little nicer, right? When that happens, will you love me anymore? No. Will you even care? No. It doesn't matter to you, right? Does it matter to you what I'm driving? I hope not. I, what's the big deal, right? If, if, if I think that anybody's going to love me anymore because I'm driving a better car, I'm crazy. Because that's not how it works. Like I say, the people who act like they're more impressed, they just want to act more impressed. So you'll have to act even more impressed when they buy the better car than you just bought, right? Now, please don't feel judged, okay? If you have more or less car than me, I'm not the standard of what cars should be. That's just what I've got, Okay? If, if, and it, maybe it's for you, it's cars, maybe it's houses, maybe it's something else, whatever it is, what are you doing where you're trying to impress others? Because friends, that's not who we're called to impress. Jesus wasn't impressed. He didn't talk about what people were wearing that day. He didn't talk about what people's lifestyle was that day. He talked about sacrifice. That's what matters to God. And He calls us to make equal sacrifice, not equal gifts, because it's a matter of of the heart. Ultimately, giving is not about money. It is a matter of the heart. And this is where we can easily get messed up on this topic. Because we can say, aha, that's right. Giving, it's not about money. It's a matter of the heart. And my heart loves Jesus. And so it doesn't matter that I'm not really giving sacrificially because my heart's there. I, I really do love him. I just don't really want to make any sacrifices so that I can give to him. And if you said that to the widow, the widow would look at you and say, you're crazy. You're missing the whole point. Those two pennies, that was all I had that day. Don't sit here and tell me that, that, that small gifts are what God wants. It's sacrifice that God wants. It's not about dollar amount. It's about sacrifice. And if my giving, if you're giving, if it's not costing me anything, if it's not changing the way that I live my life, it's not sacrificial. It's not. And we do this, we all do this in different ways, because none of, I'm betting, if you asked around the room and we got really personal and talked about finance, we all have our ways that we kind of mess up, we all have our ways, we probably spend money on stuff we shouldn't have, and, and you know, that's, that's part of the human condition. And so the question is, how much of that are we submitting to God? How much do our finances look different because we follow Jesus? Do we put giving first? Do we say, I want Jesus, I want this to be the priority? And you know, it's, if we can uh, play around with stereotypes for a minute, guys, girls, we tend to make our mistakes a little differently, right? Like guys, oftentimes, we tend to be a little more stingy in the day-to-day -day normal stuff, but then we kind of blow it on like the one big item, right? Like we're really cheap, and then we go buy a TV like the size of our whole living room, right? Or my dad, I've told you before, he was like the, the cheapest man ever on the face of this earth. I remember one time we, we went to a restaurant, and he had this coupon. It was a $3 off coupon. It had expired like two months earlier, right? And so he goes in and he asks them before we order, will you honor this? And they said, no, it expired two months ago. Sorry. And he made us leave. Do you know how embarrassing that is to leave for $3 that expired two months ago? And so, so my dad, cheapest man who ever lived, one day he goes with some friends to, to an auction where they were selling a lake, right? And he said, I don't want to go see what this goes for. So he got home, and my mom jokingly said, did you buy it? And he said, yes, which was not the right answer. <laughs> because that's a pretty big purchase, if you know what I'm saying. Like 40 years of coupon savings just went out the door right there on one lake that probably didn't need, you know? And so guys, we tend to mess it up that way. Uh, stereotypically, ladies, you're probably a little smarter than us in like those big projects, those big expensive things, but it's oftentimes more of a day in, day out thing, right? These little things. I was talking last night, and I think I stepped on a couple toes, but we were talking about nails, right? And you know, there's nothing evil about getting your nails done, but it's kind of one of those like we spend money on things we don't have to impress people who don't care, right? Because 
I've been a male for 34 years now, right? And I have never once heard a male say, dude, check out the set of nails on that girl. Oh my gosh. Not once. Not once. If you get your nails done, please don't hate me, okay? It's not evil. But all joking aside, friends, God calls us to sacrifice, right? And for all of us, we have those areas of life where we say, mm, I'm probably not living sacrificially there. If you play a simple, like, <laughs> greater than, less than game in your life, look at the amount that you are giving to God, okay? Just put that in your head. You're not writing it down or anything like that. This is how much I've given to God this year. And then contrast and say, okay, this is the amount I've spent on TV this year, right? Cable, satellite, Redbox, Netflix, whatever it is. Uh, this is how much I've spent on that. How do those compare? Or here's my vacation fund versus my giving to God. How do these compare? Or, or here's my eating out fund, right? We all got to eat, but, you know, going out to restaurants, that stuff. How do those compare? Because all those things, friends, are, are recreational things, and, and they're not evil. It's good to provide for your family. In fact, the Bible even specifically commands us to provide for our families. But, but the question is, how balanced is it? Because if I say that I give sacrificially, but I spend more on TV than I spend on God, I can't really support that. If I say that I give sacrificially, but I spend more on dining out, or I spend more on whatever the thing is, I can't really support that fact. Because sacrificial giving costs. That's what we learned from the widow that day. And God hasn't called you to give every dime that you have, I'm guessing. That was a fairly unique situation there. But God does call us to be a people who are a generous people. He calls us to live simply, but to give generously. Because that's how it works. And that's, that's why giving changes our lives. Because when we put God first, and we say, God, I want to put, your, I want to put my giving first, I want that to be my central priority. That means I reshape everything else. Because I, I reassess every other priority and say, is that really central? And I don't know about you, but I know I've talked to a number of you in this church who have told me the same thing, who are tithers. And you say, I found, and Jennifer and I, we've found that we can do more on the 90% that we live off of now than we could do with the 100% otherwise. And the reason why is because when we give away that 10% first and we make that our priority, we are very ruthless about the other expenditures. Because very quickly we say, stuff like this matters. I'm glad that there's kids that you and I will never meet that now know Jesus, thanks to Seth and his family. I'm glad for that. And that's more rewarding than any other stupid thing I could have gone out and spent money on. Right? I'm glad that there are people here in Dayton who are coming to know Jesus because you and I make sacrifices to give. That's more important to me than anything else that I could spend money on. And that's the, I believe that that's true, friends. And I challenge you if, you, if you're at this place and you're saying, okay, this is an area I haven't really turned over to God, I challenge you to consider making that step this year. So as a church, how do we do with all that stuff? You know, last year I kind of gave you this big illustration on stage. We're not going to do that much this year. Maybe next year we'll pull that out again. That's fun. But this year, um, we, this year uh, I was looking through some numbers, and uh, we looked and we said, okay, the average, uh, 2013, the average household income in Dayton was $47,063. Okay, that's a household. That's probably for several people. You may be looking at that saying, geez, I'm not there, or saying, well, I'm over that. That's not the point. Okay, wherever you're at in that, again, you know, it's not about the amount, it's about the heart. Um, but if we say, okay, we're just a congregation of average folks, Stillwater, we have uh, thus, year, thus far this year 279 giving units. Most of those are families, some are singles, um, who've given $100 or more this year. The reason we set that threshold is so that we're not counting children, because most of our children are not making $47,000 a year. If yours are, I would love to talk to them, because I need to learn some things from them. But regardless, um, so, so that means our average gift thus far is uh, $1,731, um, which would be roughly 5%, right? Now, if all my little formulas, which I'm sure are flawed in some ways or another, because those are general formulas, but if all that's right, we as a whole are, are doing much better than the United Methodist average. 
Now, that's not a great standard, by the way. The United Methodist average is not what we'd want to have as our standard for giving. We want Jesus to be our standard, right? But, but I'm very proud of this church. I really am. Because, you know, we've come through some challenging times. And our finance folks tell us that today we are at the best place financially that we've been in the past eight years. And that's exciting, I think. I think that's exciting. Have you, now, now, this year, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, we, I can say for the first time since I've been your pastor that our roof is not leaking <laughs> because we got to hire professionals to come and fix it because we had money to do that. Thanks to your generosity and thanks to, to the, the management of Marie over here who is so ruthless in getting cheap prices on these kind of things, you wouldn't even believe it. Let me tell you, she, your giving is being used very, very well. Uh, but, but bigger than that, not dripping roofs are good. But what really excites me is this is the first year in many years of Stillwater history that we have said to your, our, our staff, here is your budget, you may use it. Don't overspend it. If you do, you're going to pay. But you may use your budget fully. When, when I got here, no joke, we could not buy crayons without a whole bunch of permission asking because we truly, we were $40,000 behind, right? You don't go buying crayons when you're $40,000 behind. And let me tell you, the difference that has made is unbelievable. The difference in ministry that that has made, I've seen more kids minister to this year. We've seen VBS happen this year. We saw a great youth mission trip happen this year. We've seen so many great things, and it's your faithfulness <laughs> that makes that possible. And I am so proud to get to partner with you. The best place in eight years. What's that mean? Well, have you ever watched that show, Biggest Loser? It's a great show. And I saw somebody on there, and they were 400 pounds, right? And they, they started working incredibly hard. And they dropped pretty quickly. They dropped 80 pounds. And that's awesome. Anybody who can do that, that is amazing to me. But you know what? When they weighed in that day, the folks did not say, great job. Go home. You're done with this show. We can't help you anymore. No. They said, hey. You're still at 320, buddy. You've still got to work. And that's where we're at. We still, as a church, fall $80,000 a year behind where we need to be in our apportionments. That's our giving to the denomination which supports great missions. We still struggle to uh, keep our building taken care of. We're making progress, but, but it's, still, it's still a push, okay? We still have a long ways to go. I don't want to sound like we have arrived, if you will, but we have made great progress, and, and by God's grace, we will continue to do that. You've got in your bulletins these estimate of giving cards. If you would grab those, now maybe you're getting a little nervous and like, oh no, I'm not ready to fill this out. No problem. You're not filling it out today, okay? You're taking it, you're holding it in your hands, and you're looking at it. That's your, that's your task for today. Can you pull that off? Great. So what we're doing is we're saying in our hearts, God, what would you call me to do in this next year? What does it look like for me to give sacrificially? What does it look like for that kind of generosity to, to be happening in my life? And I want you to take that home and pray about it as a family, if, if, if you're part of a family, or pray about it uh, yourself um, if, if you're single. Pray about that and say, God, what are you calling us to do this year? Now, we don't base our budget on these things. Uh, we base our budget on trends, which help us a whole lot more, following giving trends, make sure that we're spending what we should be spending. We do this for this reason right here. Because giving is an act of the heart. And we shouldn't be haphazard in how we do that. We do these cards because, I don't know about you, but I intentionally plan all the other money that I spend. Why would I not intentionally plan my giving? And so this is a simple way of doing that. So I'm going to be praying for you, and I ask that you would pray for all of us as we consider this. What does it mean? And for some of us, We've been hearing about this tithing business, this giving 10% for a while. And we've been saying, I don't know that I can do that. It's, it's incremental steps for many. You know, oftentimes we first give our lives to Jesus. We don't just start uh, by giving 10% of our income away. I get that. But, but for many of us, God's calling us to step up to that level, to say, we can do this. We as a family can make a couple sacrifices, and we could pull that off. We, we could be fully obedient to God in that area. This is one of the few, this is the only area, in fact, of the Bible where God actually says, test me on this. He says, bring in the full tithe and, and that he'll pour out blessings on us from the storehouse of heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll always have everything you want, okay? Hear me clearly. That doesn't mean that you'll always have everything you want. 
I can only speak from my own experience, but I can say that, that for us, we've never been wanting as tithers. Some of that has been because we've reprioritized our lives. Some of that's been because God has blessed us in ways that we never could have asked or imagined. However it is for you, I've heard that story time and time again. And I want to challenge those of you who are thinking about tithing. And maybe you're saying, I don't know if we can do this or not. We're going to take God's word very literally this year on this, okay? And God says, test me. And we're going to invite you to test God on this. If you haven't done this before, we're going to invite you for the first 90 days, the first three months of 2015, uh, to give tithing a try. And, and our commitment to you is this. If you will give God that test and say, okay, for these 90 days, I want to tithe. I'm going to do that in some kind of accountable form, right? I'm going to give, put it in envelopes. So I'm going to write checks or whatever. You give that to God. And if you get to the end of the 90 days and you just flat out disagree with me and say, John, we've done that, but we don't see how God is blessing our lives. We don't see it. We don't see how we're able to do on 90% what we were doing on 100% due to God's blessing. Come to us. We'll give it back, okay? God says test us. We're happy to do that because we believe that we believe what God says there. We do. And if that's where you're at, it's not some gimmick or something like that. Just give it in accountable form. Don't come and tell me that you gave 100 grand in pennies thus far. We're not giving you that back, okay? But you do it in an accountable form. We believe that, and we hope and pray that you will too. Would you pray with me? Jesus, your challenges are really tough. And this one's tough. It is. We look at that widow, and we're all a bit ashamed because... I know for me, I'm not as generous as that widow is. God, I pray that you would help me to grow in my generosity. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to have that kind of faith, God, that we would be willing to give to you, that we would be willing to give sacrificially to you and trust you that you are going to bless us, trust you that you are going to lead us, trust you that you're going to help us to reprioritize. God, we put our faith in you because we know that we can trust you. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.